incredible moment singing about freedom. I'm sure you could just feel the power on that and the joy on that because of what Jesus has done. We all have a testimony, don't we, of what Jesus has done. And when we talk about freedom, you know, when he's singing total freedom, what does that look like? What does that mean? Some people have not tasted freedom. They know about Jesus but haven't tasted freedom. In Romans chapter 6, it talks a lot about freedom. Starting out, it talks about, have you uh, not forgotten that all of us who were immersed into union with Jesus, the anointed one, were immersed into union with his death? That's a joining together into his death. So if you've been joined with Jesus, I don't understand it, but the Bible says that somehow you were on that cross with Jesus. Somehow you were in union, immersed with him when he died. Wow. Sharing in his death by our baptism means that we were co-buried and entombed with him. So that when the Father's glory raised Christ from the dead, we were also raised with him. We have been co-resurrected with him so that we could be empowered to walk in the freshness of new life. That new life has a flavor, has a taste, it has a feeling. New life is freedom. Freedom from what? For since we were, we are permanently grafted into him to experience a death like his, then we are permanently grafted into him to experience a resurrection like his and the new life that it imparts. Could it be any clearer that our former identity, this is, this is called freedom here, Our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power. Our former identity. For we were co-crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. That's freedom. What is sin? Sin means to miss the mark. So if you have a bullseye, then to miss that bullseye anywhere else or even off of the whole thing is sin. So God has a bullseye, meaning he has a will. He has a a plan. And if you miss that mark, you're in sin. Who's got a chance? Well, under the law... We were born into sin. The Bible says that all have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. All of us were born with a sin nature. We were subjected to a really bad ruler, Satan. How did that happen? Adam and Eve gave the keys over to Satan when they sinned. They gave him authority. And so we were born under this thing with a terrible ruler. And we had no choice about it. We were slaves to sin, our nature. Right? So sin means to miss the mark. So now, without that stronghold of sin, without that old self, the old identity, the old nature, the old sin nature is now gone done away with so that you will not continue in it one one moment longer. What are some examples of missing the mark? Do you think depression is missing the mark? Interesting, huh? You think of, no, depression, people are, they're victims of depression. That's not sinning. Well, is it God's design? Was it God's design that we live in? I'm not saying God's condemning. Don't get me wrong. Oh, you terrible people. How can you be depressed? 
I'm saying that is a result of sin and a result of Satan really being in charge, right? What about insecurity? What about anger? What's interesting, this is so amazing. Okay, you ready for this? Romans chapter 6, it has the word sin 17 times. But guess what? 16 of those times, it's actually a noun. Come on, anyone gone through English class? What's a noun? Person, place, or thing. How can sin be a noun? I thought it was a verb. I thought it was an action. Now it gets deeper. What is sin? Oh, not just missing the mark. Now it's a noun? It's a person. So when someone's missing the mark, they're dealing with depression. Guess what it is? It's an entity attacking them. And so then you really have compassion, number one. You don't blame. And also, you don't say, oh, that's who they are. No, that's not who they are. Right? And that's not who you are. I dealt with, before I became a Christian, I dealt with extreme insecurity. Just all the time. Just always felt like, you know, people were staring at me. That's missing the mark. But that, well, guess what that? I, I thought it was me. I'm the problem. See, the enemy, as long as he can get you to fight yourself, he didn't have to worry about you. Oh, there's a problem. There's temptation, right? Jesus was tempted in every way, right? That's what the Bible says. Without sin. So, oh, temptation is not actually sin. That's a new one. Well, I'm having these thoughts, these terrible thoughts. Yeah, the, de the enemy's giving you thoughts, and then he's condemning you for thinking them. How could you think that? <laughs> so then he says, you're the problem. All that stuff you're dealing with, anxiety, anger, fits of rage, all that stuff, depression, it's coming from you, he says. This is what Satan says, right? So you need to figure that out, and you need to battle yourself. And so we're constantly fighting ourselves for freedom. And that's no freedom at all. And freedom really is, is a goal that we'll never attain because we're the problem. But when you realize the freedom that Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 6, you're realizing, oh, there's something else going on. Because when I gave my life to Jesus and I was born again, see, you're born once and you're born in with a sin nature. But when you're born again of the Spirit, it changes. Now you're a new creation, right? And so now the Bible says... You're no longer a slave to sin, but a slave to righteousness. So your default is righteousness. You can read it all in Romans 6. Now that you're a born-again Christian, your default is righteousness. So that's why when I was young, I worked at Office Depot, and I used to help the old ladies out with, the, with their you know stuff on the on the dolly. And so I was like, all the time I would be carrying out big things. And so the manager didn't notice anything different when I was carrying out a big file cabinet full of computers to my brother's pickup truck. Yeah, I used to steal. And guess what? At night, when I put my head on my pillow, I didn't feel one ounce of regret. I figured I got away with it and made some cash. Why is that? I was a sinner. Dogs bark, sinners sin. That's who I was. When I was born again, I would still mess up, do something bad, but now, put my head on my pillow at night, I would be struggling. Why is that? Because my nature's now changed. I'm a slave to righteousness. 
I can't handle sinning anymore. It doesn't feel good. It's not right. Something's going on inside of me. I can't stand it. Something's bugging me. That proves my nature has changed. When if you saw me fighting with a bear in the wilderness, you wouldn't say, oh, Joe's a bear too. No, you would say, Joe is struggling with a bear. That proves he's not one. If you're struggling with sin, that means you're not a sinner. That whole thing of just being not okay with sin proves your identity, your new identity, that you're a new creation. Do we still struggle with it? We still have a choice, but now you have a choice. Before, you didn't have a choice. You know what a slave is? A slave is controlled. No choices. You were a slave to sin. So was I. No choices. Now we have a choice. That's what freedom looks like. Now when depression comes, anxiety comes, insecurity comes, guess what we do? Oh, I'm so terrible. No. Who's attacking me? And How'd you get in my room? <laughs> how dare you talk to a son of God, a child of God? How dare you? Right? You don't belong here. Right? And so now sin becomes a result of deception. If your nature is not a sinner, then why would you sin? Because in some way you're deceived. Look at the example of Adam and Eve. Perfect. No sin nature. Yet they sinned. Why? She was tricked. That's what deceived means. She was tricked. She probably never even heard a lie before. And he said, oh, you're going to be like God. Don't you want to be like God? Well, of course I want to be like God. <laughs> but what she should have said was, I already am. I was made in his image. So sin now that you have a, a nature that's bent on righteousness, now sin comes from deceptions from the enemy. He promises you things that you already have in God. And he can't deliver on his promises. He never can. He promises you things. And he says, oh, that way over there, you'll never get what you need. You have to get what you need this way. A few shortcuts, that's okay. What else are you going to do? You have no other choice. And you say to the devil, shut up. I do have choice, and God gives me everything I need. And if that's pulling at me, if, I, if I'm tempted in that way, why am I being tempted? And why am I believing that? Right? Those are good questions. Because my nature now is bent on righteousness. My new nature is a slave to righteousness. So freedom comes when people understand that. When people understand this thing that I'm battling is not who I am. And it really has no power over me because of what Jesus has done. Obviously there's no pride because Jesus did it all, right? But why do we struggle why isn't there just constant freedom all the time? Deception. We are children of God. We have been cleansed. Sanctification is because you've been born again. You don't start the process of sanctification when you're born again and work the rest of your life for it. Let me, I'll, I'll prove this to you, okay? Sanctification means the process of becoming holy, okay? So are you holy or not? So when in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, you remember Solomon who built the temple. 
They did ceremonial washings. They did special clothing. They did thousands. I'm talking thousands of sacrifices. And that plot of land that the temple was built on had not seen bloodshed. It was set apart for this purpose. They had war all around except for that one plot of land David actually bought legally. And so all this, so that this one temple would be clean enough for the Spirit of God to dwell. And then they dedicated it, and the Spirit of God rested in that temple. All the preparation going into that, just to make this one spot good enough. Because God doesn't coexist with with evil, right? One more example of this is that Moses was meeting with God and it was fine. He had plenty of meetings with God, the burning, the, the burning bush and all that, right? And then he gets the call of God. He's going back to Egypt with his family now. And it says God is going to meet with Moses just like he's done before. And then all of a sudden it says God is about to slay him, about to kill Moses. And you're thinking, why is that? And his wife, Zipporah, says, oh, you're a husband of blood to me. And she quickly goes and she uh, circumcises her two boys. And then God's hand relents. Is it because God's mean? No, he does not coexist with evil. And so there was a covenant back then of circumcision. And so they they did not fulfill their end of the covenant when God met with Moses He was about to die, just like that. And I'll bet it sounds like Moses was telling his wife all along, we got to do this. And she's probably like, you're crazy, you and your religion. Because she wasn't a Jew. But I don't know what the scene was like, but she realizes they're in grave danger and she quickly goes and circumcises her sons, which was their part of the covenant. So do you see how God cannot coexist with evil? It's not that he's just mean and wants to kill people. His very presence, you'll die in his very presence if you're not sanctified. (laughs) So fast forward to the New Testament. If the temple had to be that clean to host the presence of God, how can you be the new temple of God? How can the Holy Spirit now dwell in you unless you're cleaner than the temple. (laughs) Because God cannot coexist with evil. So you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You have been cleansed. Sin is done away with. The old nature is done away with. You've been born again. And so now when you face things like anger, you say, what? What are you doing here? You don't point to yourself. The enemy wants you to think it's all your fault. No. What are you doing here? You don't belong here. (laughs) It's an entity. It's a noun. When insecurity knocks at your door, what do you say? There's no reason for me to be insecure. I'm a child of God. (laughs) Made in His image. Right? When depression comes when anxiety comes call your buddies on the phone and say listen I've got a visitor I need some backup (laughs) right and that's what freedom looks like freedom looks like this you can choose whatever you want to choose in response to any circumstance you get to choose that That's what freedom looks like, to be able to choose your reaction to everything in life. If you cannot choose your reaction, then something else is controlling you. And if you're reacting by what the enemy's doing, guess who's leading you? The enemy's doing all this stuff on the earth. Let's react. (laughs) We only react to the movements of the Holy Spirit. That keeps us in a safe place. And you can feel them, can't you? When 
when I was a young adult, I was going through surgeries, and I went through three major surgeries in two, two years. 1993, I was 19 years old. I could care less about God. I was just partying every weekend. But then, as I was going under, they would have me sign this waiver. And you know how you count backwards, and you go under 10, 199, and pretty soon you're gone. Well, th this waiver basically said, sign here, you acknowledge that you may not wake up from this. So after a while, three surgeries in a row, I'm signing this and I'm counting backwards, going out, and I'm like, this is scary. What, where would I end up? I don't know. Where would I go? So I started seeking God. And I was on crutches for six weeks after that surgery. And the day after I got off, I went and found a church. The preacher wasn't even preaching a gospel message. He didn't do an altar call. But I was in my seat. I said, God, if you could take me, I will serve you the rest of my life. Because the statistics are out. Ten out of ten people die. <laughs> so you're going to be dead a lot longer then these 120 years, I'm going to be alive. <laughs> and so even if it was just for that, but it's not just that. You get to know God now. Eternity starts now, right? And so I chose God, and, and, and I just, I got this overwhelming sense of life, and everything looked different, and I remember thinking, I want to go tell my friends. And I don't want to, I don't want to just, you know, abandon these relationships. These were my friends for years, all growing up through school. And so I remember that weekend, I went to the, the party again, which we did every weekend, and they noticed something. I wasn't drinking. And all my friends kind of gathered around, like, hey, what's, what's going on with you? Oh, I'm cool. I'm just chilling. <laughs> no, you try to downplay it, and they're like, no, no, you know, concerned friends. Why aren't you drinking? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I don't, I don't really drink anymore. And so one girl out of the group, she says so loud, what are you, one of those born agains? <laughs> and like, you know, the music stopped. Everything just, Rrr! everyone's staring at me. And I'm like, actually, yeah, I am one of those. I got born again. <laughs> and you know what happened? Friends. For years, decades, they didn't want anything to do with me. But you know what? The next day, I woke up. I wasn't sad. I didn't feel empty. Because I realized every morning I woke up, Jesus was there again. He was still there. Like I felt his presence. I, I sensed him. He was there when I went to bed. He was there when I woke up. Like, this is amazing. This is the best friend I'll ever have. This friendship went deep, and it keeps going deeper and deeper as the years go on. This friendship with Jesus is insane. He's so good. He's gooder than you think. <laughs> so what I'm realizing is I have to change the way I think because he's so good. I mean, the way he relates to me is just amazing. He's been the best friend over the years. He's really fun. He, he'll point things out that need to be changed. But you know when he points things out, it's, it's like I have so much peace. It's never condemning. He's brilliant. He's the, he's the most brilliant person you'll ever meet. I mean, the God of the universe. You can ask him anything. And so I realized this friendship was worth it. This friendship was worth it all. All the partying, all the friends, all whatever. This friendship, I, I'm, I'm hooked. It's, it brings life to you, to your soul, even to your body and your spirit. It's just, he's, he's, he's just amazing. He, treat, he treats me so good because of this. He doesn't have one ulterior motive for our relationship. It's pure love. He doesn't want me for, any, for something. In fact, the times I tell him about 
asking about ministry or whatever. Hey, what about this? What about that? He says, oh, we'll get to that later. Let me just love on you some more. <laughs> but what about this? Oh, we'll get to that. Here, just take my love. I just want to be with you. What? Who does that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, just, he's just amazing. That's what, that's what freedom looks like and feels like. And it, if, if you've ever dealt with stuff, if you ever struggle with things, some people I know have struggled with things for, for, for years. Realize that everything that you've ever wanted or need is found in Jesus. It's true. It's true. I, I, you know, when you want that, that feeling of buying something new, you know, like I, I love Amazon packages. It's just that feeling, you know, and you're like, ah, oh, it's toilet paper. Bummer. <laughs> you can have that in Jesus. Forget saving up for the car. Just hang out with Jesus. Forget the new TV on the wall. Just hang out with Jesus. He's got all that for you and more. <laughs> Forget the position, the title. Just hang out with Jesus. He doesn't care about that stuff anyway. He's just so good. Friendship in, in John chapter 15, it says, I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends. Wow. It's nothing we could have done. He did it all, but he elevated us to this position of friend. Friend of God. Friend of God. It's available to everybody to be a friend of God. It's insane. It's amazing. It's better than every, anything. Religion, eh. Religion just makes you feel like you don't measure up and you just got to do more and more and more to get to God. Religion is man's attempt to get to God. But Jesus came to us. He came to us and he went through everything as a human tempted in every way. He was tempted way more than we could ever be tempted. Why? Because we give in. <laughs> when it gets too hard, he never gave in. The devil tempted him and said, I'm going to give you all this. I will give you keys to all of this. Just bow down and worship me. And Jesus was looking at him. I could tell. He's like, I came for those keys, but I'm going to get them in a different way. I'm going to get them with humility. Could you imagine that in, in, with Satan and, and on his throne with all his demons and, you know, Jesus is walking on earth. He's tempted him. He's tried so many times to get him. And then Satan finally says, kill him. And then when he died, the enemy thought he won. If Satan would have known what was going to happen, he would have never killed Jesus. So when you think you're going through something, believe me, five years from now, you're going to be like, oh, that's what God was doing. He's always got a plan. Amen. Romans 8, 28 says that everything works out for good for those who love him. So if it's not good yet, it's not done. Because that's a promise. One of the, my favorite stories of the resurrected Jesus is found in that road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24. It's kind of long, but I'm sure you guys are good. My, I looked at my battery. It says 16 hours left, so I'll be good. <laughs> <My battery. clears throat> Later that Sunday... Two of Jesus' disciples were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a journey of about 17 miles, long walk. They were in the midst of a discussion about all the events of the last few days when Jesus walked up. Uh, so this was right after Jesus died. So they're still thinking he's dead. Okay, and they're talking about all the stuff. He'd been here for three years, did miracles, everything, and all of a sudden he's dead. And they're talking about it, right? They were in the midst of the discussion 
about all the events in the last few days when Jesus walked up and accompanied them in their journey. They were unaware that it was Jesus walking alongside them, for God prevented them from recognizing him. Why, why would he do that? He, he's fun, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, if I was God, I'd do stuff like that. <laughs> Jesus said to them, you seem to be in a deep discussion about something. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> they stopped, and the one named Cleopas answered, haven't you heard? Are you the only one in Jerusalem unaware of the things that have happened over the last few days? Jesus asked, what things? <laughs> the things about Jesus, the man from Nazareth. They replied, he was a mighty prophet of God who performed miracles and wonders. His words were powerful, and he had great favor with God and the people. But three days ago, the high priest and the rulers of the people sentenced him to death and had him crucified. We all hoped that he was the one who would redeem and, res and rescue Israel. Early this morning, some of the women informed us something amazing. They said they went to the tomb and found it empty. They claimed two angels appeared and told them that Jesus is now alive. Some of us went to see for ourselves and found the tomb exactly like the women said, but no one has seen him. Jesus said to them, Why are you so thick-headed? Why do you find it so hard to believe every word the prophets have spoken? Wasn't it necessary for... Christ the Messiah to experience all these sufferings and then afterward to enter into his glory? This is the best part. 17 miles, remember. How long does it take to walk 17 miles? <laughs> then he carefully unveiled to them the revelation of himself throughout the scripture. I want to hear that sermon. He started from the beginning and explained the writings of Moses and all the prophets, showing how they, were, how they wrote of him and revealed the truth about himself. As they approached the village, Jesus walked ahead, telling them he was going to a distant place. No, he wasn't. <laughs> He's so funny. They urged him to remain there and pleaded, Stay with us. It will be dark soon. So Jesus went with them into the village. Joining them at the table for supper, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. All at once, their eyes were opened, and they realized it was Jesus. Then suddenly, in a flash, Jesus vanished from before their eyes. Wow. Come on, Jesus. He's so amazing. Stunned, they looked at each other and said, why didn't we recognize it was him? Didn't our hearts burn with the flames of holy passion while he walked beside him, while we walked beside him? He unveiled for us such profound revelation from the scriptures. There was a, a, a moment in my office I was praying and reading, and literally I felt and I knew the presence of Jesus just walked in and sat down next to me. And I was so, I mean, I, I wouldn't say scared. It was like terrifying. My, it, it was like I couldn't move. And it was that way for a while. I was explaining it to one of our um, just amazing members, Larry Hino. And Larry said, he starts crying. And he said, God just wanted to show you that he's with you like that all the time. I was like, man. It's like these guys, you know. Didn't our hearts burn within us? How come we didn't recognize him? How many times are you and I going through life and Jesus is right there? And we just don't recognize him. Because you said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So either he's a liar and our emotions aren't really that reliable <laughs> or, or no, it, it, or it's true and our emotions aren't that reliable, right? Because sometimes we feel alone. Our emotions aren't that reliable because Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's always with us that much. I want my heart to just be alive to that fact.
all the time. And it's just so amazing about Jesus because, you know, the way he relates, is there, there's been so many times I'm doing house projects or even, even ministry or whatever, and then at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I didn't really talk to Jesus that much today. I was really busy. And I talked to Jesus at night. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. You know, I just, you weren't really on my mind. And he says, you were on mine. And then he says, he always says this. He's done this to me so many times. Let's do it together tomorrow. Let's do it together. He's so into relationship with you. He's such a friend. Like a friend you've never experienced. You know, you all have good friends. This is a friend you've never experienced in your life. And that is available because he died on the cross and made a way for all of us to have that relationship. He basically said, everyone's fallen short. Everyone deserves death and death of the soul as well. But Jesus says, I can't. And the, the father really was his idea. I can't imagine heaven without you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go pay that price. I'm going to take your place. Wow. Pride is just silly when you think of it that way. <laughs> he took our place. He died on our behalf. So I just want, you know, if there's someone here who's never taken up that opportunity and said yes to Jesus, I just want to give you that opportunity. So if we could all just pray together, if you want to commit your life to Jesus, pray this with me. Father, forgive me. For I'm a sinner and I've fallen short. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Taking all of my shortcomings. Thank you, Jesus, for living the perfect life for me. I identify with your death. I receive your forgiveness. Wash me clean by your blood. Cause me to be born again. And I ask that you would take out the old and you would fill me with your spirit today. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. I'm going to spend just a couple moments because I don't want to just talk about the resurrection without experiencing the resurrection. Because it says we are to experience new life in the resurrection. Jesus didn't raise himself. It was the Spirit of the Lord that raised him. That resurrection is re resurrection power. And it's available. He defeated death, right? So you can hear the story of the power of the resurrection, but never experience it for yourself. So I want you to experience it. And I just feel like God wants to do some things in this room. One of the things I want to go after first is if you have an injury from an accident, I believe Jesus wants to heal that today. I don't care if it's 20 years old. Let me give you a testimony just so you know. No, nothing's impossible with God. We had a staff member who um, came down with hepatitis B, which is in incurable. She had a, uh, a county health officer came to her house and read her all this stuff, put her on quarantine, all this stuff. Well, we went over and we prayed for her as a staff. Next time she goes to the doctor, the same week, the doctor says, I don't understand this. But you do not have hepatitis B any longer. But this is the crazy thing. You have the antibody for hepatitis B. So you can never catch it. 
and she has the paperwork from before and from after. See, we don't, we're not in denial of things. We just know God's bigger. And so God can do anything. So those of you, if you have an injury, even if it's a small injury from an accident, and you want prayer, stand up right now. We're going to pray for you. Yeah. Thank you, God. We just apply the blood of Jesus to these things. And we ask, Father, that you would just rest your healing power upon them, God. We release the power of the resurrection on these bodies right here. We command them to be healed, be restored. We command the trauma to be canceled in Jesus' name. We command the bones to be realigned, discs, ligaments, muscles. And we command the pain to leave them right now. Just... Uh, Pay attention to what's going on in your body. You may feel heat in that area. You may feel tingling. We have seen so many things right in this room heal just like that. And this is why we do this. Because Papa God loves you so much. He doesn't just care about the terminal illnesses as you would think God would he cares about the discomforts. He cares about the small things because he loves you that much. In the Gospels, it says Jesus, when they brought people to him, Jesus healed some of them. No? Most of them. All of them. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we just release the healing presence of Jesus upon you that all those who come to Jesus will be healed. I want to pray for knee. Anyone have a knee issue? Just put your hand right on your knee. And we just pray for healing right now. God, just come with your healing touch and restore the knees in this place. We ask for a creative miracle that you would recreate cartilage and we command inflammation to be cast down I feel like there's some people who, who deal with migraine headaches we want to pray for that as well put your hand on your head and just say yes Lord I receive your healing touch come on I receive your healing touch we don't want to just talk about the power of the resurrection. We want to experience it. I want you guys to encounter Father God today. I feel like there's something more with the migraines. I feel like there's something with the brain. There's something going on. I don't know what exactly, a cyst or need surgery or something. Something with the brain. Does anyone want prayer for that? Okay. Okay, so we just pray for that. Why, why don't you, yeah, we just pray for whatever's going on in her brain. God, you called it out. You didn't want to let it go. So God, go, just heal that. Just restore that, God. We thank you. We thank you for your touch. I want all of you to just Imagine If you could close your eyes and imagine this. I want you to think about the story of the prodigal son. Because the father's arms for you are just wide open. He wants to embrace you. And so if you could close your eyes for a second and think about Father God. If you could imagine Father God, the God of the universe. And look, and his arms are wide open for you. But not only that, he is running towards you. He is running toward you. The God of the universe, the King of kings, with all his dignity, 
throws it out the window because he wants to be with you so much. He runs towards you. He puts his arms around you. He picks you up. And if you could see the look on his face, he is so happy. Not because you're all put together and perfect. Not because you came to church. He's so happy just to be with you. He's so happy just to be with you. Let him just love on you right now.